We'll be looking at the first nine verses this evening in the fourth chapter. Starting at verse number one. Hear ye, children, the instruction of a father, and attend to no understanding. For I give you good doctrine. Forsake ye not my law, for I was my father's son, tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother. He taught me also and said unto me, Let thine heart retain my words. Keep my commandments and live. Get wisdom. Get understanding. Forget it not. Neither decline from the words of my mouth. Forsake her not, and she shall preserve thee. Love her, and she shall keep thee. Wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. Exalt her, and she shall promote thee. She shall bring thee to honor, and when thou dost embrace her, she shall give to thine head an ornament of grace, a crown of glory, shall she deliver to thee. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that... <clears throat> as we're gathered here this evening, Lord, that we'll see as we've even worked through these previous three chapters that though I may be standing here this evening preaching a sermon, Lord, uh, that wisdom is more than something that's displayed in an hour in the pulpit. Wisdom is seen every day, every minute, every hour in which we live our lives. Lord, I pray that we'll see that in this text, you call for our wisdom to be on display for the world. Our lives are the loudest, most continuous sermon preached before the world. Lord, I pray that you'll give us strength this evening, wisdom as we decipher through your word. We give thanks to you for all that you've done. In Jesus' name, amen. There are times in our lives where we seem to compartmentalize our spiritual lives. Uh, and meaning that there are times in our lives where we try to divide our lives up into spiritual activities. We think of spiritual times in our lives as Sunday morning. Oftentimes we think about Wednesday nights being our spiritual times in our lives. These are, these are days when we tell ourselves we need to be in the right mindset when we meet the Lord. It's as if we develop in our own minds that God is concerned about how we behave in the house of God, and yet God is not concerned in how we behave the rest of the week. It's that we start to believe that he only cares about us making him first in the morning and that he doesn't care about how we live the rest of the day on our job. The book of Proverbs up to this point has reminded us that God cares about how we live. He wants our lives to be as spiritually rich and as spiritually in touch when we come to the house of God as we are on the workforce. When we're encountering lost people, when we're encountering brothers and sisters in Christ. Wisdom is not something that we, oh, we're going to oh, close my eyes and open my Bible and I'm going to read one verse and it's going to be my tip for today about how to live. Wisdom is more than a tip for you how to live out your day. Wisdom is a person. Wisdom is a person in which we know is Jesus Christ. And the reality is, is if we lack wisdom in our lives, what this, in areas that we lack wisdom in our lives, it is a problem being manifested to us that we have a problem with Jesus. Now, we don't like to think of it this way, but when we looked last week at the 26th verse in chapter 3, it said, For the Lord shall be thy confidence and shall keep thy foot from being taken. When we, when we looked at that verse, we said that the explanation of that is not only that he is our 
confidence, but that he is our companion, and that as we are facing the troubles of life, that the Lord is walking with us. That is the Lord that is keeping our foot from slipping, and as we follow him, and as we walk the course that he's laid out for us, eh, that when we veer from that course, we understand that we veer from him. Here in chapter 4, he takes everything that he said in chapter 3 and he brings it to the home. In chapter 3, S Solomon puts us in touch with the Lord. He, in verse number, chapter 3, in verse 5, he tells us to trust in the Lord. He, he tells us to acknowledge him in all of our ways. He tells us to that the Lord is our confidence. He tells us even more in verse 19 and 20 that it is the Lord who founded the world. As he goes on, he tells us it is the Lord who keeps us from sudden fear. Even more, it is the Lord who gives you rest. If you were to read chapter 3 and chapter 4 in one flowing measure, you would feel like, Solomon, what are you doing? Because when you read chapter 3 and read chapter 4, it seems so redundant. It seems as if Solomon is saying the same things, and he really is, but he's just chained up, changed up the words here. Uh, what, did, what are you doing, Solomon, to mention the things that you said in chapter 3 to say again in, in chapter 4? Let me give you some examples here so you can see what I'm saying. In chapter 3, in verse number 12, we see that the chastening is at the hand of the Lord is much like the Father's chastening. But in chapter number 4, in those first three verses, when we see that word instruction, it is the same word, musar, that you see in cha uh, chapter 3 and verse 12, that this is also the instruction of a father. So we see Solomon is again redundant with speaking about this instruction, this correction at the hand of a father. In chapter 3, in verse number 13, he speaks about wisdom and understanding. In chapter 4, in verse 5 through 7, he talks about wisdom and understanding. In chapter 3, in verse 22, it's about life and grace. In chapter 4, in verse 23, it's about life and grace. In chapter 4, in verses 11 and 12, he talks about going the straight way and not stumbling. In chapter 3, in verse 23, he says, go the safe way and, and don't stumble. In chapter 3, in verse 24, he talks about sweet sleep. In chapter 4, in verse 16, he says there's no sweet uh, sleep for the wicked, but for those who aren't behaving wickedly, they get sweet sleep. Chapter 3, verse 25. He talks about the ruin of the wicked in chapter 4 and verse 19. He talks about the path of wickedness and the ruin of the wicked. Chapter 3, verse 26. He talks about God being the confidence in our path. Verse, chapter 4 and verse 18, he talks about the path of righteousness is bright. 31 of chapter 3 talks about not envying the violent man. Chapter 3 and verse 30, or chapter 4 and verse number 17 tells him to not drink the wine of violence. Chapter 3 and 31 tells him not to choose his own ways. Chapter 4, verse 5, 14 and 15 tells him not to walk the way of the world and not to walk the way of the evil man. Why is Solomon being so redundant? I mean, this is the same thing, right? Over and over again. So what is Solomon's point? Why is Solomon giving us really these same teachings back to back? And I believe what Solomon is saying here in chapter 3, this is what the Lord is teaching. In chapter 3, we, we find the Lord being the central focus. The Lord is the one educating. The Lord is the one giving us understanding that we can have confidence in him, that we can trust him, and that he will give us the right. He will, he will, he will. But in chapter 4, what changes? In chapter 4, Solomon brings us to the home and says that the same thing that the Lord is teaching his children in chapter 3 is the same thing that mom and dad should be teaching their kids at home. 
That's the difference between chapter 3 and chapter 4. In chapter 4, the father is educating and the mother is educating their children. And yet, the first thing that we're giving to us here in understanding is that the consistency that was happening in the home. Hear ye children. The instruction of a father in attend to no understanding. For I give you good doctrine. Forsake ye not my law. For I was my father's son, tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother. He taught me also and said unto me, let thine heart retain my words, keep my commandments, and live. He said, not only was my dad consistent to give me instruction that matched the Lord's instruction, but so did my mom. I really believe that, that we see here in chapter 4 that the education that Solomon received from his father was an education that matched the education that his father had received from the Lord. How do we apply this? Well, how we apply this to our own lives is that our children, as we instruct our children on how to live, the things that we advise and teach our children should match the things that we have learned from the Lord. The things that we advise our children to do and to not do should be advice that matches the instruction of the Lord. The commands that we give our children should be commands that also match what the Lord. Notice also what he says here, secondly, really. He says that this education is multi-generational. My father sought wisdom and taught me. Solomon says, I sought wisdom, and now I teach you. And you need to seek wisdom and teach your son. By Solomon doing this, really what he's saying, I mean, if you think about it in the aspect of age, Solomon has covered basically over 150 years, just in three generations. So what does this mean? It means that seeking wisdom is a lifetime of living. Seeking, seeking wisdom, getting wisdom from God isn't something like you get three years or four years in a seminary and say, well, I don't need no more wisdom from God. I've learned it, I attained it, and I'm, I'm on my road. No, Solomon says, listen, seeking wisdom from above is a lifetime journey. The longer we've been saved, the longer we serve the Lord, the longer we've been in his word, the more we realize we need more of his word, the more we realize that we need more of his wisdom. Look, look also, wisdom is not meant to, to have a little note when you get wisdom from God. Look at what he says here. When you get wisdom from God, it's not that you write a note down and say, well, I'm great. I, I've now found the answer to this question I was searching for in the word of God. He, he, this is not what happens here. As God grants you wisdom, Solomon says, he also grants you the responsibility to share it. As God opens your eyes to the word of God, it also gives us the responsibility to share with others what God has shared with us. And that's a part of us seeking wisdom. That's a part of God granting us wisdom from Scripture. That is what Solomon is saying. Listen, the reason that Solomon was instructing his son, the reason that he was showing them Scriptures, the reason that he was advising them in the Word of God was because his father advised him, and his heavenly Father advised him. Meaning that the things that God shows us is beneficial for others. It's beneficial to help the next generation of followers of Jesus Christ. Our kids and those who are watching us ought to see what we are getting here in the church matches what they are getting in the home. They ought to see that the way in which we live, it doesn't matter whether it comes to what you're listening, to what you're watching, or how you're just strictly behaving. It ought to match what they're learning in the Sunday school class. 
there ought not be contradictory messages coming from the parents. Uh, I fear that we live in a generation that, according to scriptures given us here in the first four verses, it doesn't matter whether you allow your kid to run off into the room and be raised up on the iPad. It doesn't matter whether you allow your kid to be raised up in the Xbox. It doesn't matter whether you allow your teacher, the kid's school teacher, to teach your kids life lessons or the neighbor next door to teach your kids life lessons. Just because your kid grows up and makes it, it doesn't neglect the fact that it was your responsibility to teach your children the word of God. Also recognize you cannot teach and you cannot give what you have not sought. We have to seek in the scriptures. We have to seek wisdom. We have to seek the Lord. We have to nurture this relationship. We have to, as we follow the Lord and gain wisdom, it is through this that we further instruct our children. But also notice what he says here in verse 2. We teach, the world teaches our kids about life, but before we reason in our heads that, well, I've prepared my kids for life, before we reason that, look at what Solomon says here in verse 2. For I give you good doctrine, forsake ye not my law. It's our responsibility to tell the good things of our God to our children, the good things. Well, oftentimes when I was growing up, when our families would get together, wisdom would be passed on. But oftentimes it was worldly wisdom. Wisdom would be passed on about how they won a fight, how they won this much money in a hustle, how they got this job and now that they're the boss. Wisdom may be passed along about what group of people to stay away from or what part of town you shouldn't go near. And listen, some of these things are important parts of life. Some of these other things would probably be better left unsaid. But Solomon says it is our responsibility to pass down generational victories to our children. It is our responsibility to teach our children the good things of our God. We should be telling our kids, this shouldn't be foreign to our kids' ears about how we honored God and we kept his words and he blessed us for doing so, about how we trusted him in our trials and how he brought us through. It shouldn't be strange to us that our kids hear that we raised him up and lifted him up as our Ebenezer, as our, our rock of hope in our life. It shouldn't be strange to our kids that we've been clinging to the Lord. I'm saying it ought not be strangers to our kids' ears that we're the kind of people to praise God for the good things that have happened in our life. It's a good doctrine. It's a good teaching for our kids to hear us praise the Lord. Now, I'm not saying that we're not supposed to give our kids wisdoms on life and other areas, but what Solomon is saying here, it was a good doctrine, it was a good teaching that I've given to you about how good God has been to us. Our kids ought to hear us talk about the good things of the Lord. Then he encourages his son here in verse number five, get wisdom, get understanding, forget it not. Neither decline from the words of my mouth. This is the same idea of Psalm or of Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 23 when he says, Buy truth and sell it not. When he says, Get it. This, this term, get it, is really in the Hebrew, it is a commercial transaction. This is what's being presented to us. The understanding is of a commercial transaction. It's to say that what he is saying here is that wisdom in your life, guess what? It costs you. Mm -hmm. When he says get it, he means don't ever expect that getting wisdom is going to come easy. 
Don't expect that getting wisdom is it going to cost you something. Listen, it's going to cost you time to set aside time to study God's word. It's going to cost you time to set aside time to have a prayer life. It's going to cost you money to buy books that you help read and to help you understand God's word to get the wisdom extracted here. Listen, getting wisdom costs you. It always has. But notice the drive of Solomon here. The other day, Caleb was looking on the Internet, and he had found this piece of equipment that he wanted to purchase for his business. As we were talking about it, I said, well, son, it's worth it if you could get it at this price. But if you can't get it at that price, it's probably not worth it. Then I came back and said, you know what? Maybe you should try to trade him this and then throw some money in. And if you could get it for that price, well, then it would probably be worth it. But if he's not interested, don't do it. You see, when I was having this conversation with my son, I was saying it was worth pursuing. But in the same breath, I put limitations on that pursuit. I said, it's only worth it if you can get it under these conditions. But notice what Solomon tells his son here in verse number five. He says, get wisdom, get understanding and forget it not. Neither decline from the words of my mouth. Notice he does not put any limitations on this. He doesn't put any, well, you know, son, uh, listen, if it's going to cost you a couple hours a day, if it's going to cost you a bunch of time, if it's going to cost you this, then it may not be worth getting. Notice he said, listen, son, I'm going to send you on a pursuit. This is going to cost you in your life, but do not stop until you get it. And when you get it, continue on and get understanding for it. Whatever you do, pursue this with all your heart. Get wisdom. The last part of this verse says that wisdom has a cost. Not only do we understand that wisdom has a cost to get it, but we also understand that wisdom has a cost to keep it. Notice, get wisdom, get understanding, forget it not, neither decline from the words of my mouth. Getting wisdom is not just about understanding it. Getting wisdom is about obeying it. He says, get wisdom, and what? Get wisdom, get understanding, and forget it not. Neither decline from the words of my mouth. He's like, once you grab a hold of this wisdom, once you grab a hold of this understanding, don't you forget it. Don't you stray from it. Don't you walk away from it. And by the way, wisdom will cost you in life. Like I said, it's, it's not just about getting it, but it's going to cost you in life as you obey it. It may cost you your popularity at work when you refuse to go to the party after the job. It may cost you uh, your popularity with your friends when you refuse to break the rules. It may cost you your praise from the world. Wisdom has a cost both to get and to keep. But notice what Solomon does not say. He doesn't say there's too high of cost either way to pay, to get it and to keep it. It's worth giving your all to get it, and it's worth giving your all to keep wisdom. Look at what he's saying here. Son, it's a cost worth paying. Any price to get it, any price to keep it. But notice also what he says, when you get it, look at what he does here. He says, son, when you get wisdom, when you, get, when you finally get a hold of wisdom, when you finally get a hold of understanding, Son, I want to talk to you about how you're going to treat this knowledge that you've gotten. Verse 6, forsake her not, and she shall preserve thee. Love her, and she shall keep thee. Love her. This word here used in the text when he says love her is kind of a familial, a family term. He's saying, listen. Love wisdom. When you get wisdom from God, when God shows you something in his word, 
When God grants you understanding about something that's going on in life, don't just say, great, I understand it and move on. He said, you should love it like you love your mother. You should love it like you love your wife. You should love it like you love your sister. You should love it like you, like you love your daughter. Embrace her. He'll go on to say in verse 8, to embrace it like you embrace your mother, like you hug her, like you give her this loving compassion. When God shows you something in his word, you ought to embrace it. You ought to love it. You ought to praise God for it. Your heart ought to be warmed that God would, from heaven look down upon us lowly people and give us wisdom from his word to give us comfort from his word compassion from his word and we ought not to forget about what God has showed us in his word I believe that how many times that we could say that we have wondered and got ourselves into trouble over something that we had already knew the scriptures warned us about You will not find yourself in trouble if you lovingly embrace and lay hold on and give a hug and cling to the truths of God's word that we have been taught. Look, he says, love wisdom like that. That's how precious it is. That's how precious it is to walk with the Lord. That's how precious it is to walk with him in this path. Forsake her not, he says, and she shall preserve thee. Love her, and she shall keep thee. And all of this, he says, if you will love wisdom like you're supposed to, if you will love God's word like you're supposed to, if you will love the teachings of Scripture like you're supposed to and cling to it. He said, you know what the reward for all of that is? He said, Look at what the verse says. Forsake her not, and she shall preserve thee. Love her. And what does he say? And she shall keep thee. He said, hey, look, if you will just love God's word like you're supposed to, if you will just cherish God's word like you're supposed to, if you will will just keep his word as you walk in this path, he said, you're going to find security. You're going to find a safe place to dwell. You're going to find peace in your life. Again, like he said in chapter 3, he will soon remind us, you're going to find sweet rest. You're going to find sweet comfort. The, the, the wicked ain't going to find sleep, but you will. The world could be turned upside down and everyone will be biting their nails, but you will find sweet peace because you know what? God is in control. Sweet peace, even more. He says, not only will you find security, but verse 8 says, she will honor thee. What does he say? Exalt her, and she shall promote thee, and she shall bring thee to honor when thou dost embrace her. That's an interesting way of putting that, isn't it? It kind of reminds me of so many other passages. Exalt her, wisdom. Whose wisdom? Jesus Christ. And she shall promote thee, and she shall bring thee to honor when thou dost embrace her. So many passages come to my mind, even when I thought about John the Baptist saying, you know, I must decrease, but he must increase. And then who does, what does Scripture say? Who does Scripture say that Christ doth magnify those who are humble, those who are lowly? When we will live like we're supposed to and make much of our Lord, he will promote us in the time that so needs to be. He will bring honor to us when we do embrace her. Exalt wisdom, exalt the Lord. And when we praise him, and when we praise him, he will increase, we will decrease. But look at what verse 9 says. And then what? She will be a crown of glory. She shall Give to thine head an ornament of grace, a crown of glory. Shall she deliver to thee? This is a vivid retelling. We see a father telling his son the same instruction that the Lord gives. 
chapter 4 is really a, a, a challenge to us. And it only gets harder next week. But chapter 4 is a challenge to us to ask ourselves, what message is the world getting from us? What message is our home getting from us? Is it the same message from chapter 3 that the Lord told us? Do the Lord, do our children, do the people around us hear us when they start to bring up the financial times, when they start to bring up that there's war overseas, do, that we're going to end up experiencing the draft and experiencing all these problems. Do they hear us saying the same things that the Lord told us in chapter 3, that we've got peace, that we've got confidence, that we've got comfort, that we trust that God's in control? Is that what our children hear when, the oh, Dad, you know, uh, so-and-so said this, so-and-so said that. I mean, what does this mean for us? I mean, are we, son, let me tell you about my Lord who's still sovereignly in control. What, what is the world hearing from us? What is our children hearing from us? Are we faithful in troublesome times to deliver the good teachings, the good things of the Lord that was taught to us in chapter 3? We've got to be consistent. Our message should not be different from the Lord's message. We shouldn't waver. He didn't waver. It was uncertain times when chapter 3 was going on. And yet Solomon says, even in this time, we can take God's word and take all of his promises and hide them in our hearts and with confidence go home and teach our kids and not worry that we're lying to them, not lie, worried about shorting them, not worried that we're giving them a false step. Matter of fact, how many times have we gave our kids advice and they came back like, that didn't work out? Well, I didn't expect it to go that way. But yet, when we have confidence in this, we never have to worry about giving the wrong advice when it's rooted and grounded in the Word of God. So let's be consistent. Let's be rooted. Everything in chapter 3, everybody who's around us should hear in chapter 4. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you for all that you've done. We thank you for, Lord, we thank you for the wisdom that is continuing to be delivered to us in Proverbs chapter 3 and in chapter 4. Lord, I pray that the things that you've showed us should be things that we echo in life. Lord, the things that you've showed us, even down to our simple salvation, Lord, how we are sinners in desperate need of you and how you opened our eyes to see our need of you and how you changed us and how you saved us and how you redeemed us. Lord, this should not only be a message that comes from you to us, but this should be the message that comes from us to the world. Lord, give us the boldness. Lord, give us the strength to be witnesses as we should. We thank you for all that you've done. In Jesus' name, amen.